Hey, it's Karen Calla. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Biddies. This is the Drink As You Learn School with two longtime friends. And sometimes we're just two boozy biddies. Let's discuss a dark time in U.S. history, even darker than today, in our opinion. Yes, it was a dark, dark day when the U.S. outlawed alcohol. Today we discuss the 18th Amendment, otherwise known as Prohibition. Who thinks it's cool to ban alcohol? Well, you know what? Not Connecticut, because we didn't ratify. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Connecticut and Rhode Island are the only two states not to ratify the 18th Amendment. Interesting. I just, you know, I think outlawing alcohol actually created way more problems than they thought, because it's like the rise of bootlegging, speakeasies, gangsters, you know. Yep. It caused a lot of issues, and it was kind of an amendment that really still only benefited the rich and not the poor. Yep. And I mean, we know it doesn't work. It's like, remember during early COVID when they were trying to close liquor stores? And everybody? Yeah. I remember when Colorado <laughs> shut down, they originally said that all liquor stores and dispensaries would be closed. Like a lot those of are non-essential states, items. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of other states still kind of kept them open, but Colorado was like, no. And then there's like this mass rush to the liquor stores and the dispensaries to like stock up. And they're like, okay, no, no, no. We're trying not to uh, like create crowds like this right. is the opposite effect you can have your liquor stores and dispensaries back <laughs> yeah no what were they thinking but they actually did try it on a national level because even though connecticut and rhode island did not ratify they only needed three quarters majority so oh really yeah so they still had to follow the rules although of course like a lot of other places they you know found their ways around things and went underground yeah, I mean, then there came, like, the religious exemptions, and I think you were still kind of allowed to make stuff at home, but, like, the idea of, like, branded alcohols were not allowed to be sold, really, anymore. And it was the creation of the death of a lot of breweries, distilleries, wineries, especially, you know, around the area, and, and some of the only ones that existed after that were ones that either got religious exemption licenses to sell to churches or they like switched like breweries switched to like soda making and stuff like that to keep open. They found ways around it as we always do. I mean, yep. drugs are illegal in a lot of places still and we still find ways to smoke pot, you know. It's <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's some like we're like thinking like what? 1920s here comes the day of the flappers, the great gatsby kind of bullshit. A lot of the terms that we're going to talk about in this episode are familiar ones like bootlegging, legal sale of alcohol, speakeasies, so those nightclubs that were selling illegally underground, bathtub gin, informal production. Yeah. And then two that you might not have heard, because I hadn't heard them before, blind pigs was another way of saying like speakeasy or a place where you could get alcohol. Uh, so I don't know why they'd be like, let's go down to the blind pig on the corner. I don't know. And then also clip joints were like disreputable places that sold alcohol that basically were to set up to... Like, you would get dropped off there, and you would drink and get drunk, and then someone would rob you. Ooh. So, yeah, got to be careful. Okay. So <laughs> avoid any bar called the clip joint. Right. Also, please don't get your hair at a place called the clip joint, because I feel like it's just like budget haircutting. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing good happens at a clip joint. Yeah, but the idea behind what Prohibition on the 18th Amendment, it banned, and it actually just, December 5th is the repeal day, so that just passed a couple weeks ago. Oh, so we're only a little bit behind. <laughs> yeah, we almost kind of planned this out correctly. <laughs> yeah. It's also my mother's birthday, so that's also how I remember this. But Prohibition essentially just banned the manufacture, transportation, and sales of intoxicating liquors. Like, what liquor is intoxicating? Like, <laughs> like why a, do you have to specify that? <laughs> yeah, it's a very, like, I don't know, it's an interesting, it's like containing alcohol would be, <laughs> like, a more objective thing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was ratified in 1919, and it was named the Volstead Act because I guess that was the congressman from Minnesota that, yeah, he was, Andrew Volstead of Minnesota was the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, and he was the pusher behind Prohibition. So fuck that yeah. guy. He is not a spirit stud. Yeah, it's, I think it's false, pronounced Volstead, but yeah, he was Volstead. the one who like basically helped to like try to enforce it and like the... It's a federal thing. So we had like the FBI agents and the feds going around trying to stop the transportation and sale. And they were like mildly successful in some cases, but for the most part, there was just too much desire and too much action going on. Yeah. Like, I fuck that guy. <laughs> 
He's definitely ever, up there with Pliny the Elder as far as not a spirit he, stud. Right, exactly. <laughs> Did you ever watch any of... um? What's it called? Oh no, it just went out of my head. Is it the Boardwalk? documentary by that guy? No, never. Oh mind. well, that well, that there is a Ken Burns documentary on Prohibition, which I have not watched, but I will still recommend because anything about Ken Burns is good. I have not watched that one either. I've been working my way through the baseball documentary series he's been doing. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> ew. Thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> I do not share your love of baseball, Kella. I no. do like going in person, but like, okay. it's, I can't, but I can't watch it on TV. And I definitely can't watch a documentary about it. That's fair. Actually, That's I'd fair. probably rather watch a documentary about it than actually watch it. It's so. actually quite good. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll put that on the list too. Otherwise, there's a Ken Burns documentary. But then also, you could just watch Boardwalk Empire. The, I've actually uh, not watched that. Yeah, so that I didn't finish it, but now I'm like, I don't know if I should go back and finish it. I think it's one of those things where the final season got a little bit eh. Yeah. But it is all about basically like, and they're loosely some of the characters like Lucky Luciano are actually based on real characters. Some of them, like Steve Buscemi's character, who I forget what his name is, are not. But it's all about like the gangsters and the mobs that. Yeah, because I was like, we're, we're a real riser. Like I mean, Al Capone and shit like that. Yep, and yes, yeah, so Al Capone's in it as well. But mm-hmm. also part part of this because you couldn't manufacture transport, even though it did happen. The United States for the beginning for a while actually increased the rum. The de- I guess the demand for rum in the United States because what they would what they would do is they couldn't make it, a lot of alcohols in the United States is they would get rum from the Caribbean and there was I guess a big place where they would they would touch down in, like right around Atlantic City, New Jersey, to uh, get the alcohol in. But then the Fed started busting them like out at sea, so they couldn't get the rum in anymore either. Huh. I didn't realize yeah, that. But, but there's definitely rum coming in for a while, then whiskey being made, gin being made, and then all sorts of just crap, grain alcohols and poison. There's lots of, you know, all of that bad alcohol and bad distillation leading to people just basically dying and going crazy and blind. That Apparently not quite as crazy as the gin craze that we discussed a couple episodes ago. Yeah, but, not, yeah. not quite as much so, yeah. Still <laughs> not like the most like respectable products that have been made in, in the world. Right. Yeah. I didn't like, so like researching this, I mean, you're the history buff between the two of us. There was like the anti-saloon league was conceived by this guy named Wayne Wheeler. And that was like part of like what helped push this 18th amendment through. And at that point it was ratified by the requisite three fourths of the states or something like that. I think at this point there were only two states that weren't states. Right, I think, I think Hawaii and Alaska. Alaska. Yeah, so I think it was forty-eight. So, so forty-eight of the states exist. Yeah, at so, this point. so forty-six out of forty-eight did ratify. Yeah, but like you're saying, only Connecticut and Rhode Island. So, although like I would think like New England would be so cool about this, but like one of the first ones was like Maine or Massachusetts that went first before even the the act was initiated in 1838. Massachusetts passed a law banning the sale of spirits in less than fifteen gallon. Quantities. I mean, that's still a lot of spirit. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not bad. That was repealed, but it started that idea. And then Maine became the first state in 1846 with prohibition laws. And then they even made them stricter. But most of the other states kind of followed suit with their own like state legislature by the time of the Civil War in 1861. And then it just kept, you yeah. know, spiraling into were chaos. Probably a, lot, a lot of like, mostly guys, right, going down to, like, the saloon or wherever, or the local bar, the pub, and it's getting tanked. Yeah. So I guess there was some, you know, need for some restriction, but banning it was a little excessive. Well, yeah, and they say that women, I'm sorry about our gender right now, they apparently played, like, a massive role in this because they saw alcohol as a destructive force in families and marriages. (laughs) Right. I actually think their, like, advocacy against alcohol, like the temperance movement, also, like, helped... But I think it helped women like organize and gain political traction for them then shortly afterwards attaining the vote. So they were kind of hand in hand. But then I guess they got the vote and then alcohol was banned and then women started drinking more than ever because they would go into the speakeasies and stuff too. So Yeah. But yeah, that's like that whole like anti saloon thing we talked about with that weaver guy or wheeler or whatever his name was. I've already forgotten it. But it was part of an urban growth reaction and That temperance movement that you're talking about was like part of the rise of like evangelical Protestantism and saloons were corrupt and ungodly. And yeah, so they said that also like with prohibition, this would help like prevent accidents 
and also increase efficiency for business people because if people weren't getting tanked on a Tuesday night, then they would show up to work bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to almost get their finger cut off in a canning machine. I don't know. Like, <laughs> well, I guess that makes some sense, but I don't know. Oh, for sure. Like, <sighs> we've boozed on weeknights and the next morning felt crappy and, like, foggy at work for sure. But who hasn't oh, as an so adult who drinks? But between that, I was like, it's all still so religiously based. And when did the idea or the intention of church and separation start? I know it like, or church and state separation start because I know from it never actually. the beginning actually, of the United States. From the yeah, but it beginning. never actually worked. It still doesn't work these it's days. Still he- yeah, heavy, heavy, heavy influence is yeah. with our abortion rights. It's oh, so God. Crazy. There's a, speaking of documentaries and a tangent that Cal is going to go down, there's an amazing <laughs> documentary called Hail Satan? Question mark at the end, hence the inflection. <laughs> Oh. And it's about the Church of Satan and the idea that like, I think it was like Alabama that wanted to put the Ten Commandments statue at their state capitol. Right. Yeah. And so they said, well, it's a religious thing. So this the Church of Satan said, well, then we're going to put a statue of Baphomet up there because that's our religion. And like they like built this whole fucking <laughs> statue of the goat and like was like, well, if they can have that, I can have this to prove that like we're being religious nitpicky freedom. about yeah. which religions we choose to acknowledge and which ones we don't. So as obviously, that's a documentary. Yeah, it's on Hulu and power through the first ten minutes because the first ten minutes are like a little hokey, and you're like, "Who the fuck are these people?" But then you get into like the deeper idea of like their why they do this, and it's not like all doom and gloom and sacrifice. It's like basic human rights is what they're behind. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm okay. okay with this. We like, we yeah. like basic human rights. We're into that. Yeah, I'm all about that. But yeah, so obviously religion <laughs> of which, and- Of which drinking is one of them is a basic human, oh, basic yeah. human right. Oh yeah. God, if they ever try to ban alcohol, I don't even know. Okay. We moved to Europe. There's probably too many lobbyists from the alcohol industry like influencing Washington oh, sure. D.C. though. So it's like tobacco. Like it'll never go yeah. away. But yeah, I just, it's a, it's a sad time. But yeah, it is, you know, religious revivalism and families and, and stuff like that that are pushing this. They were looking for abstinence from alcohol, but wanted more moderation. And these perfectionist movements, like the abolitionist movement to end slavery were at the time. So there was this idea of just like restructure, refocus, good or bad kind of thing happening. But it, like I said in the beginning of the episode, it really was still a rich person's like luxury for these speakeasies and and whatnot because it mostly impacted more rural areas and they did see like a decline in drunkenness and arrest that in those areas because there was no way to find it and they didn't have necessarily the money or the social structure to figure out these kind of cool little speakeasies but you know they probably were at the clip joints <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's my understanding of the clip joints is like someone maybe from a more rural area who had enough money to travel or go somewhere, but they'd like go to New York City and it was like basically a scam where like the what's the person in the hotel? I had a concierge? Yeah, like the concierge. Actually, I wrote a big thing. Or maitre d'. Yeah. I actually wrote the entire thing. Okay. Yeah. But so I forget where I'm quoting from too. Sorry, bad notes, but. But verbatim, the sucker was usually brought to the clip joint by a, <laughs> by a taxi driver or sent there by hotel clerks. So the taxi drivers and the hotel clerks were sort of in on it. He was assured that he would find girls galo- galore and Ooh, lots girls of good galore. liquor. Girls galore. Girls galore. And lots of good liquor right off the boat. Presumably rum or something. When he arrived, he was immediately importuned to buy drinks for, from one or more of the hostesses who intimated that they would be available for more interesting activities after we get through work. The girls usually drank gin highballs, which are compounded of water and a little orange juice or ginger ale. So they were like not having such alcohol, but the sucker was given a double slug of raw alcohol doctored to resemble whiskey. Oh, if, he got, if he got helplessly drunk, he was simply robbed and dumped into the gutter a block or so away from the clip joint. I'm sorry. It's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, the nickname is a sucker, so he's kind of a sucker. Yeah. <laughs> if through some miracle, he remained fairly sober and showed a disposition to quit spending, the usual procedure was for one of the hostesses to accuse him of insulting her. Thereupon, the floor manager would dignantly tell him to leave and present him with a bill, an outrageous compilation which included a large cover charge, a dozen drinks he hadn't ordered, 
all those he already paid for, a bottle or two of liquor, a half dozen packs of cigarettes at a dollar each, and extras. If he paid, he was permitted to depart, although he was lucky if a sympathetic hostess didn't pick his pocket over he reached the door. If he protested, he was kicked and slugged until he was groggy or unconscious, after which he was robbed and thrown out. So there's no winning for this person. No, definitely not. And it seems like the clip joints were a special variety of speakeasy, um, mostly just in New York City. I don't know if like New Orleans or other big centers had them, but it's from what... God, this poor schmuck. Like he just like thinks he's like going to have some fun drinks, which he can't access all the time. Maybe get like the P and the V or something like Mm -hmm. that. (laughs) Like just be like having a great old time. And instead he's like in a gutter, out of money or a combination of both. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's kind of like... so. I read, this is on, which one was this one from that I got? The Mob Museum, Prohibition and Interactive History. Ooh. But apparently there were 32,000 speakeasies in New York City alone at the height of Prohibition. And so I think there are just so many. So somebody might come and be like, oh, like I'm finally somewhere where I can go get some alcohol and have a good time. And so, you know, enterprising taxi drivers and hotel clerks would be like, oh, go to this place. And then I'm assuming they got a cut after the guy was robbed. I mean, like, everyone wants, like, their hand in the deal. Like, you know, if you can, like, align yourself with this lineup of people, like, then, yeah. I mean, it even, like, still makes sense sometimes. I remember when I went to Cuba with a partner, we, I, like, let him get swindled just to teach a lesson to him more than anything. That's <laughs> the story. He kept saying, he's like, you're being so mean to these hustlers. And I was like, I'm not being mean. I'm just ignoring them because like, I don't need to. And, you know, we had a, a couple, like we were sitting in a bar and a, a couple approached us and tried to give us like tips. And I kept being dismissive and cold and, you know, and then something the, it starts the sob story with like, milk is so expensive and we have a baby and like we need milk. And then, you know, he's like, okay, like we'll get them some milk. And I was like, on your own, bud. (laughs) And so like they take us to a specific grocery store and a specific checkout person where we pay the equivalent of 30 US dollars for milk. And (laughs) then when we go outside, he's like, I just feel really good about that kindness that I gave to them. And I'm all right. Just sit here and, and watch. Sit here with me and watch. We watch them immediately go back in the store and return without the milk. I'm like, they had this downline here. It's like a pyramid scheme of sorts. Like they get the milk, they have the cash out person who charges us way more than me, and then they go give her her cut and they get their cut. And then dumb Americans are being dumb Americans in Cuba. <laughs> Yeah, so, so it's, it's, the idea, it's a very like, similar system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little different and a little similar at the same time. The a, little less, like, a little less violence and like beating, maybe. But yeah, <laughs> no, we definitely didn't get beat up or anything. I mean, I was not in the gutter at the end of the day. Maybe I was because I was drinking daiquiris and mojitos in Cuba, yeah. but that was on my own fault, not because mm-hmm. I got swindled into a clip joint. I'm really yeah. interested about this clip joint <laughs> kind of thing. I had no yeah. idea. So yeah, but best avoided, if, but, you know, you can research them. But yeah, but it, it, it did, forcing it to go underground definitely didn't make it stop. Oh, God, no. PSA, just like banning abortions, also will make abortions stop. It will make it stop. Okay, last, last, just, last, last Everyone last. will find it somewhere else that's safe. Right. But so it will that, never go away. Right. So that's our PSA. PSA. But so yeah, well, these speakeasies, it also sort of, invented the birth of cocktail culture. So either we have these like really awesome, like underground jazz clubs that served like a higher end clientele and higher end cocktails and things, or we have like more divier, I guess, speakeasies where they were still like sort of making cocktails because they had like more poorly made alcohol that was like tougher to drink because it was, you know, roughly distilled and tasted like crap. So then we have like those like not fancy cocktails, but just like your whiskey and ginger, ginger ale, like things like that, where they're mixing things with soda. And they're saying that what I was looking at said that a lot of times it actually led women to drink more than they had before because where before they would just like sip at some wine or some sherry. Now they have like some like grain alcohol being heavily disguised in like a Coca-Cola. Yeah. And so just like more just drinking them. Plus like they, you know, and didn't Coca-Cola the right- at the time have, like, cocaine in it, too? So I think it did. So that's like a speed, a speed ball, right? Basically, like an upper and downer. 
you're it's like a vodka Red Bull these days. <laughs> it's yep. an upper and a downer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, and then but like women got the right to vote, so there was more freedom. This is also this is from the same thing that you know, so eloquently described the sucker going around. But <laughs> just six months after prohibition became law in 1920, women got the right to vote. And coming into their own, they quickly loosened up, tossed their corsets, and enjoyed their newfound freedom. Well, that's where you get the idea of the flapper <laughs> with, like, the short haircuts and the fun dresses and, like, the the dancing. And it's a good thing we don't record these on video anymore because I'm doing yep. some weird arm movement things. And I'm not <laughs> good dance. at dancing. But, yeah, that's, like... Very much, like, the initial freedom of women in this, like, whole art deco, like, new phase of things. Did you see – I mean, no one else can see except for Kara, but I I am drinking a gin Ricky oh, in honor art deco of glass. this in an art deco glass that's, you know, very similar. But also I realized that a gin Ricky is literally a gin and soda water with lime, the thing I drink all the time at bars. <laughs> <laughs> so you should be ordering a gin Ricky? Well, I, <laughs> I was like – uh, it's like ordering from that episode we did with Lauren and Chris about these like classic cocktails. And I'm sure a lot of these stem from the idea, like the highball that you're talking about, the idea of mixing, yeah. you know, poorly made alcohol with a mixer to make it taste better. You know, in that root cocktail episode we did with them when they were talking about the kangaroo cocktail, I feel like if I went to like a lot of the dive bars that I usually go to and was like, can I have a gin Ricky? They'd be like, what the fuck? And I'd be like, gin and soda water with a lime wedge, please. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to assume when you assume you make an ass out of me, we hear that all the time. Right. Well, it's like I, I used to go around, I was a bit of an asshole about it when I was, <laughs> what, 20, but I used to go around and like ordering French 75s at places that had no idea what they were. And then I would just, you know, walk them through it like I was just so knowledgeable and cultured. Well, like, were you kind about it or were you a dick about it? I was mostly kind about it. Okay. There were some times fair. where I was trying to teach people in Italy how to make it, and my Italian was not serving me as well. And so I, I was not unkind, but I feel like it was a kind of frustrating experience for both of us. <laughs> no. I mean, that makes sense. Like, I've definitely, like, been on the bar side of things as a bartender where someone comes up and is like, I'd like this. And I've always been like, coach me through this. I don't know how to make this. And, like, some of them are like, ugh, 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 you, what? You don't know? And I'm like... I'm fucking bartending weddings where we serve mostly draft beer and shitty New Hampshire wine. Like, what do you want me to do right now with this? Right. This is, I'm who you have to work with. Let's yeah. make it through either side. Have people. you seen the bar behind me? It's full of crappy liquor. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just pick one. <laughs> one of the notes that you wrote down that I'm interested in that I didn't know. So during speakeasies, the term dating was invented. Yeah, so again, dubious sources. I didn't like triple fact check it, but basically they we were We never saying, do that though, so it's fine. Yeah, it's true. So it's, you know, 90% how you say it, 10% what you say. But Sales. Par- <laughs> yeah, but apparently Confidence. these, you know, women being out and about at the bars and the speakeasies and hanging out, it sort of like loosened social mores where it wasn't like you're just going with a fellow and like he comes to your door and takes I like you out. I like how you said going dead, so with like, a fellow. Going with a fellow. But it's just like, yeah, I'm just dating. It was very like, it was used like even more casual to signify more casual than we would use it today. Because I think now we're like, we're dating or we're fucking. <laughs> like, it's, it's like we're in a serious relationship. We're dating. We're fucking. Yeah. Now are we like friends with bannies? <laughs> like, are, yeah. uh, are you seeing other people? Should you put the condom on? <laughs> like, are we exclusive? There's so many layers to it these days. Right. So now, so this how many was people like have the, you swiped on recently? Right. It's just the beginning of those layers. So instead of just like I'm betrothed, I'm going with a fe- going steady. Now I'm dating. <laughs> I think we should bring back terms like, what did you say? The going with the fellows or whatever? Going, go, going with the fellow, yeah. <laughs> going steady. Are you, I should, you know, I should my be like, are you my, my, are you my fellow? Man. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Leading my bow. <laughs> Inter- or are we just dating? Yeah, I just, it's like, I'm like confused about women during this time because it's either like, Alcohol's bad, or like, yes, alcohol. Well, I think it was all of like, you know, the mothers with like six kids and their husband is spending all of their paycheck from the, I don't know, the grist mill at the bar every Friday. <laughs> there were probably some white collar workers of the time too. I think I would just okay. like, you'll lose your finger in a canning accident or you work at the grist mill. Is how we're talk- yeah, this is where we're like also objectifying the rural areas at this point that were hurt horribly by prohibition and not the the great Gatsby's of the world out here. Yeah. Or maybe there was a country solicitor. <laughs> 
good could, name for a bar, the country solicitor. Yeah. <laughs> Kara, that's also the we should go into. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Open a so basically, but yeah, so there's all these like more middle age, which back then was like what, 35 <laughs> women. <laughs> I mean, what was life expectancy at that point? I hate to say it. Yeah. You pop out a bunch of babies without birth control. Like, that's going to wreck your body and your, like, quality yeah. of life for sure. Yeah. So basically, but they're, like, so those more middle-aged women were championing the prohibition. And, you know, I'm sure there were some young women a part of it. But then they got prohibition and then they got the vote. And then all of, like, the 17 to 25-year-olds were going wild. Maybe 22, because by 25, they were married and having kids, too. Yeah, it's just so different. <laughs> it's the yeah. 30, what am I? 30, 33. Three. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Jack once- and I spent a lot of time recently trying to figure out how old we are, so that's why. Well, I, I just feel like once 30. you pass 30, you just, like, think about, like, the next year you're going to. Like, I turned 33, so now I'm like, I'm pretty much 34. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. does it matter? Nothing exciting happens in my life anymore. No, like, Tiago and I spent like an entire week thinking we were 34 already. And then yeah. we had to do the math. And then we were like, oh, we're actually 33. <laughs> but you guys are the same age. Yeah, he's four months older. Oh, I thought he was like way older than you. Good for you. No. But yeah, I mean, so <laughs> sorry for all of the damage <laughs> on Prohibition. I'm just like trying to look at the notes if we like need to like cover anything. And I guess we could talk about like why it ended. Do you, so you have this section on counter Prohibition. We talked about rum. Oh, basically, there's there's just one fun thing I was saying. There just like you think about speakeasies, like these more traditional, not traditional, but like these ways we think of people evading prohibition laws. They go to these underground bars or whatever. But I just thought it was fun when they were talking about Connecticut resisting the 18th Amendment, even though they had to you know federally comply. Mm-hmm. But they talk about this one old inn that's still in operation, but the castle in Old Saybrook was still widely known to serve alcohol to its guests. But what they had to do was they could seal liquor behind false walls and in large closets in guest rooms. So imagine you could just be like staying in a room and open up a closet and like there's like booze. <laughs> right. I mean, that's much better than Kara and I when I um, went to her bachelorette party in Hudson the closet that we opened had just a bunch of creepy old stuffed animals in oh, it. God, that was <laughs> yeah, do you remember that? Kara <laughs> and I went to this really quaint like house in Hudson, New York for her bachelorette with a bunch of girls and Kara and I shared a bedroom and I went to open the closet and there's just all these stuffed animals that like old school, like vintage, <laughs> like weird Mickey Mouse, Sesame Street kind of things, like not all it, sitting up and facing us. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we came back drunk one night, we got really creeped out by these old uncomfortable stuffed animals in the closet and threw them in the bathtub and did not realize that we had done that until like one of the girls went to shower and like pulls apart the shower curtain. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> so I would have much rather preferred to open a door and see like secret liquor. That'd be great. Much, much better. better than the creepy big bird. I mean, I used to work at the place that I bartended in New York, Maine was called the York. I, I think it's still open. It's called the York Harbor reading room, private club, not like a country club. There's no golf. There's no tennis. There's nothing. It's a place to eat and drink for private members. And we had a lot of, I, mean, I, was, I was about to say walks of life, but that's not true. It was a lot of rich people from different areas of life. (laughs) But it was called the York Harbor Reading Room because it was open during Prohibition for members. And they called it the reading room because they would wrap a bottle of whiskey into a newspaper. So the men would go there to read the newspaper. But inside the newspaper was the alcohol and the cigars. So they would sit there and drink on the water in York, Maine, like very gorgeous building. And that's how that place started. Neat. So yeah, so all sorts yeah. of fun ways to keep the alcohol going. It's true. And I guess partially because no one really stopped drinking, it eventually yeah. led to the end of prohibition. It just, yeah, like we said, it caused so many more problems. But, you know, like why did it end, I guess, is how we should wrap up this episode because <laughs> it did end. But like the working class and poor were more restricted. We talked about how this benefited the rich, essentially. Even with costs for law enforcement, jail, prison spiraling upward, the support was waning. I don't think that's a sentence, Calla. I think, okay. I think you put two thoughts together. There are heavy costs for law enforcement, jail, and prisons spiraling out of control, But there and there was support f- by the end of the 1920s for... Oh, support for prohibition was ending by the end of the 1920s. Okay, thank you, Kara, for like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually, I super <laughs> appreciate you right now for... You know me so well. You're fluent in Calla. That's yep. what I love. But then... Oh, my God. Fundamentalist and native... Nat- Nativist. Nativist forces, shut up, gained more control over the temperance movement, alienating moderate 
members. So I guess, okay, like, so it's like the idea of like the far right with the Republicans or even the far left with the Democrats. Like all of a sudden you're like, well, we had an idea and like you took it seven steps too far. And now we don't agree with it anymore. We're just going to walk away. (laughs) Now it's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Like it was cool to think about this. And now you're like, please stop raiding the Capitol. (laughs) (laughs) Also, Franklin... Delano Roosevelt ran for president on a platform calling for its repeal, so he won over Hoover. Yep. And then he repealed it. Yep. And then Utah was the state that provided the 36th and final necessary vote for ratification to end prohibition. Um, I'm like, Utah. Interest, yeah, interesting. Well, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> so I have this note. All states accepted alcohol by 1966. In parentheses, it was Mississippi. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? What, 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 did, what did Mississippi do? I remember writing that note. I was, yeah, super gung-ho about all podcast stuff like two weeks ago. It was, a, like I said, a, a, one of my ADHD medication-fueled days. I was like, I got this. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. There is apparently one state that was fighting it, is I think what I meant to say, and it was Mississippi. Oh, they're, they're a holdout. <laughs> yeah, they were a holdout <laughs> on it. That's why I was like surprised that Utah was the deciding vote in this because Utah. And I have like a very Conradian fascination with the abomination thing with like the Mormons in Utah because it's just like interesting to me. But I'm sure that like apparently Mormons used to like ban caffeine a lot and then like you're so Coca-Cola. supposed to have it. Well, like then all of a sudden, like Coca Cola, like came in and like gave them a lot of money, and it sounds like all of a sudden caffeine's kind of okay, and so does now. <laughs> what well, it's, it's everyone yeah. has a price, is what I'm learning from prohibition. <laughs> <laughs> prohibition. But yeah, but alcohol is legal in all states are accepted now after 1966. Yes, yeah, so you and can drink legal. alcohol. Everywhere in the U.S. In case you didn't know. <laughs> yep. Could, you guys, you can drink alcohol in the U.S. It's crazy. <laughs> yep. Well, on that note. <laughs> on that note, Kara and I are going a back-to-back, so we'll be on this next episode whenever it premieres before this one or that one. But yep. here we go. Right. Double fist yourselves. Double fist yourselves, biddies.